Uh, welcome to our session with the criminal justice managers. Um, this is a part of the 16 days of action. Um, our Changing Lives Women and Children's Services have come together to call to action. Um, we're united as one services, one united specialist pillar to come together to challenge the assumptions that some women are understood as complex and hard to reach. We'll do this by sharing our practice and our research on supporting women experiencing multiple layers of disadvantage, violence and abuse. Uh, the managers on this call are going to talk to you about their experiences, but also the experiences, more importantly, the experiences of the women who access their services. Hi, I'm Nicola Salt and I'm the service manager for the Criminal Justice Services in the Western Midlands. I just want to bring to people's attention the injustice for someone um, that receives a sentence under IPP, which stands for Imprisonment for Public Protection. Um, this means somebody is given a low minimum jail tariff, but no maximum jail tariff. It's a really unfair system and it was abolished in 2012, I think. Um, but it's not that's not been done retrospectively. So anyone that was given this sentence before that date still has that hanging over them. Um, and the the impact it has on women particularly is huge. Um, I'm going to give an example of a woman that we've been working with for quite some time. This woman, Tanya, was given a tariff under IPP for arson. And we know this was a desperate act of self-harm, as it often is with arson. Um, she'd suffered years of domestic abuse, um, terrible mental health, self-medication through substance misuse, and she just got to breaking point. So she was given a shorter sentence in 2004, served back. 12 months in custody and has been released and there's been no further offences of arson since that date but she is still under that sentence um we've been working with her for some time now it takes her such a long time to trust professionals she knows at any point if she discloses um an issue around mental health a, a violent relationship um concerns about substance misuse that could lead to her being recalled at any time um so there's an example about four weeks ago, she contacted our um, caseworker that she's working with. The police were called out to attend to an incident of domestic abuse from a current partner. Police turn up to her house and he knows how to play the system, the partner. So he mentions that Tanya is an IPP. The police straight away are considering recalling her and putting in custody to keep her safe. And now she's a victim in all of this. She's called the police out because she's a victim of this violent attack. And now the tables are being flipped on her and she's got this sentence sitting over her. Um, the, the impact means that she doesn't trust professionals. Luckily, she trusts the caseworker that works with herself and she's got a good probation officer. Um, and we reflected the other day on, on what she's done in the last 12 months. So she's been free of heroin use for, tw for 12 months. She drinks once or twice a week. She's enrolled at college. She's enrolled at a gym. She's looking at some volunteering positions with SUIT, which are a substance misuse um, service in, in Wolverhampton that work with people with lived experience. And she's left a violent relationship. But still, she's got this hanging over her head. Um, and I think there's just a few comments that she made that I just want to sort of share. Um, you're constantly on edge. Your mental health is impacted massively. You have no idea when and if it's going to end. And I think my final comment that I want to make on this is that these sentences were intended to be given to high risk, repeated violent offenders and sexual offenders, not a woman who wanted to end her own life during a crisis with her mental health. Um, that, that's that's a story from from Wolverhampton. Thanks for sharing, Nick. Hi, I'm Linda, the manager of, manager of the criminal justice system in Staffordshire. And today I'd like to share one of the many stories from one of our women. This lady in her twenties was full of hope and excitement about the future. She'd met who she thought was a wonderful man with a super job. They were happy they, and thought that they'd have a great future together. She gave up work because he was the main earner and he preferred her to be at home looking after the after the home and him, making sure his uniform was always clean, pressed, so it looked perfect every day at work. On the outside, they were the perfect couple, but on the inside, things soon became very different. It started with a slap when the dinner wasn't ready. She was stunned, shocked, hurt, embarrassed, but who could she turn to? Everyone thought that they had the perfect life. 
No one would believe what was really going on. It soon escalated. He was beating her most days. The abuse became more sinister. In her words, sadistic, perverted, depraved. Looking back, it was as though he got a great pleasure from the pain he was inflicting on me, on her. Of course, it was always behind closed doors. The injuries were, were to her intimate part, so not visible to anyone. Her confidence had gone. She had no friends, no money, no control. All those hopes and dreams that she had in her 20s were just a distant memory now. She was broken. The day that changed her life was when he came in from a night shift, threw her out of bed and repeatedly started kicking her in the groin. She had to make it stop. The pain was excruciating. She grabbed the nearest thing and hit him with it. It was only a hairbrush. He did stop on that occasion, but it was not the last she was going to hear of this incident. Soon after, she managed to pluck up the courage and left him, moved away, but he still would not leave her alone. Eventually, with the support from the domestic abuse services, she got the restraining order against him. She thought she'd be safe. Some months later, the police knocked on her door and wanted to talk to her about an incident. The incident when she'd hit him in self-defence with the hairbrush. She admitted it. She always told the truth. At that point, not realising the consequences of, the act of her actions. She now has a criminal record. Charged with assault, occasioning actual bodily harm against her ex-husband, who had beaten, degraded, tortured and ripped away any shred of confidence that she ever had. Again, in her words, her self-esteem is non-existent. She's broken. She now lives in a small flat miles away from her hometown. She's lonely. She detests being on probation. She feels angry. She feels it's a total injustice. But she doesn't have the willpower, the confidence, the motivation to try and bring any charges against him. Who would believe her? He's at the top of his game now in his profession. So who would believe what he did to her? And to be honest, she says she could not face reliving the abuse in front of a courtroom. She doesn't go out apart from going to probation. She's fearful of applying for any jobs as she thinks people will judge her because of the conviction. She just about survives on benefits. If only she left him sooner. So now I'm going to introduce another story of a woman in the criminal justice system. So my story is about 20 years of physical and emotional abuse from my husband. After years of living in a state of fight or flight, my life is spiralling out of control. My home life is a constant battle. My children see this on a daily basis. To numb the pain, I admit that I do drink too much. A life with my husband is all I've ever known, good <clears throat> or bad, I can't leave. He has the job, he has the money, and he has the respect. At this stage, Sarah's children became known to social services. Sarah's husband explained to their social worker that Sarah was a drunken and unfit mother. In doing so, he attempted to deflect any blame from himself. Sarah was then asked to leave the family home in order to protect her family. Because my husband needed to keep full control over me at all times, he arranged for me to rent a flat from one of his friends. He had the keys and the access to all of the money. I'm now living alone, away from my children, feeling worse than I've ever felt before. The anger and the pain I feel towards him is crippling. After another vicious argument between Sarah and her husband, Sarah defended herself with a kitchen knife. Although she did not wound us, uh, didn't wound her husband, uh, she did damage the tyres of his work vehicle. Sarah was put on probation. Over the next six months, her mental health declines rapidly. Unable to see her children, she loses hope for the future. Over this period, she has made many threats of suicide, grieving the loss of her home life and both her children and her, and her husband. 
sadly, Sarah did hang herself um, in her own flat. She texts her husband and just says she can't take any more. Um, yeah, my name's Fran Aiken and I'm the service manager for the East Midlands. Thanks, um, Fran, Linda and Nicola for sharing the experiences of our women. It would be great to say that these experiences are very few and far between. The reality is they belong to virtually every woman that enters into our system. Very, very few come in without a story. Um, and many of those stories do include domestic violence, abuse. They feel there is nowhere for them to turn. That Those that should have been protected have become a part of the problem. Um, so anything you'd like to add, ladies, to the what we've shared today and what you've shared and about your experiences of working with the women? I, th I think for me, it's just that recognition, isn't it, that yes, they may have made, um, they may have done something through um, lack of lack of alternatives or a cry for help or made a bad decision. Um, but so often there's a whole, as you're saying, uh, Lynn, there's a whole story behind that, that they're, they're more often than not a victim of some, 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 some horrible trauma. Um, and then I think also you do see women are made examples of and shouldn't be responding in, in certain ways to, to things that have happened to them. And quite often they have longer sentences, even community sentences, than their male counterparts would have. Um, it's just, the, it, the system's just stacked against them, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think we see this all too often and it's time that this was changed. It's time that this there is a change in this. We can't be treating people the same at court, um, perpetrators, victims, whatever. They can't. There's got to. There's got to be a backdrop to the to stories. To, you know, so you just see a woman because actually a woman has dropped that many uh, cases against partners that have beaten them and abused them and whatever. It's been dropped and dropped to the point where the police probably get quite fed up with going out yeah. to another because we know she won't do anything yeah, about definitely. it. Blah, 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 blah. And then how very dare she retaliate? Or even a lot of the time where um, where there's been some injury caused, it's actually been through self-defence. Yeah. So an injury has been caused to the partner that has battered her for years through self-defence and there's not a chance we'll either up them charges. That's definitely going to court. And that is where we see women having their children removed, uh, having sentences because they are the one with the record, not the perpetrator, not the, 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 the partner that had been the perpetrator for many, many years. The, there needs to be the time to listen to the woman's story before it gets to court, before she's yeah. she's up against the court, so mm -hmm. her st she needs to be able to tell her story, what's got her to where she is today, before she's got the conviction. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Fran's story, the absolute there isn't anything out there left for her. Everything no. that's, that's had any importance in her life is now gone. Yeah, and so the professionals should have looked at that in context and being better at looking at that full story not just black and white she hurt him why yes. what what had gone on before yeah that's it the full story needs yeah. to be heard listened to it, it's yeah. giving that um that acknowledgement to, to to the voice isn't it it's like we know when a woman speaks up against that they'll have been I don't know what what's the average fifteen incidences that they've not disclosed before. So it, it, mm -hmm. you're encouraged to talk out. When you do start start to talk out, you're then judged, and then there's other things that come yeah. into play. So you're you're almost encouraging women to then not share their stories, and that's what that, that this whole thing is about is about sharing stories and and hearing and acknowledging the power of of, of the woman's voice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to say thank you all very much for your time uh, for uh, bringing those stories so we could hear the voice of the women that are in your services. Um, and just a reminder that 16 Days of Action Against Gender-Based Violence is an international campaign that runs from November the 25th to December the 10th and encourages action and awareness against all forms of violence against women and girls. 
we hope you heard the stories and we'll take away with you some of the messages that we wanted you to hear today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.